All right, let's begin where we left off, just passing in review with the 13th verse of Hebrews 9. And of course, last week, I took a good deal of time to go back into adoption and and covenant versus sonship and adoption being complete. And the covenant resulting then in our sonship, that three of our kids was naturally born and the other two was adopted. And I would not. In fact, God used that to teach me about adoption and says, David, my oldest son who's here, when he comes and asks you for something, what does he base it on? I said, totally, totally sonship. (laughs) When they raid the refrigerator, they don't pull out the adoption papers or anything to say, I'm going to take a sandwich. They just take it. So I'm your kid. <laughs> you know, I'm your kid. And they just take it. Well, and Daniel and Tan, because they were adopted. But see, there is no difference between David, Bill, Steve, Daniel, and Tan. Adoption's complete. There is no difference. And he asked me, what if they pull their adoption papers out before they ask? you for something that the other ones just come and took. Well, I said, well, the beating would be the thing they wouldn't forget. <laughs> that would insult me. See, that would insult me beyond measure. If they pulled their adoption papers out and used them as a basis to receive because they're my son, my daughter, Bone of my bone, marrow of my marrow. They're me. I'm them. There's no difference between them. None. Well, he goes to say here, in 13 then, For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more Shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit. Now, the part of him that was offered, of course, was his human spirit. He says, as the Father had life within himself, he gave to the Son to have life within himself. Well, the Son, life that he gave to him couldn't have been his deity. Because there was never a time that his deity did not exist. It had to be his humanity. In fact, when he said in him was life, and that life was the light of men, the life that was in him was the first human spirit to be born spiritually alive in 4,000 years. And that was about to become our light. Because when we were quickened together with him, and the same life that's in his spirit is now in ours. And because that new nature is in our spirit, It's become our light because now our nature is the same as His. So we have pure, undefiled access translated from darkness to life with the capacity to understand God. So He says that He's been offered. How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God to purge not the blood of bulls and goats, the sanctifying or purifying of the flesh. But see, this, this went to your spirit and purged your conscience because it gave you a new nature from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that was under the first testament or the first covenant that they which are called might receive the promise of eternal eternal inheritance of course which is eternal life through sonship now notice this verse very closely here he said that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that was under the first covenant Now, of course, because he left all the Gentile nations out, 
It's because the book of Hebrews was primarily written to the Jew. And Paul, like a lawyer, was differentiating between the two covenants. The one that he gave to Abraham, which he added the law to because of transgression, the Jew. And then the covenant he gave to the whole world, including the Jew that represented or that ended up in sonship, which is what you and I possess right now. Well, he says, for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant that he gave Jesus. Well, again, he's talking to the Jew right here. Now, this gets interesting. Jesus was born under the law, born of woman, that he might redeem them that are under the law, for he became the curse of the law to redeem them that was under the law, which was the Jew, that they might also receive the adoption of sons. So even before the Jew could receive the adoption of sonship, Galatians 4 says, that Jesus had to redeem them from the law. Well, this is what he's talking about here, the way that he did that. Of course, earlier we studied Galatians 4 in some detail. But the way that he did that, he says, In due time, God sent forth his Son, made of woman, made under the law. Well, because he was made under the law, he was under obligation to fulfill the law, to keep the law. Well, the problem was that, that that was impossible. This is the contention of Romans 7. Now, in Romans 7, Paul, speaking hypothetically in the position of every Jew, he said, I had not known sin, save the law said, thou shalt not covet. But a spiritually dead man doesn't know he's dead until somebody tells him to stop sinning. Then he can't, because he's spiritually dead. Well, that's why Romans, the book of Romans declared that both Jew and Gentile is under sin. And in the same book, the book of Romans, Paul said he proved both Jew and Gentile was under sin. There's not one righteous, no, not one, he said. So now all of a sudden we have the Son of God made of woman for Gentile nations. But he was made under the law also. And anybody born under the law, Jewish, they were under obligation to keep it. Now here he has an obligation to keep the law. Here's the difference between him and any other man that was ever born. He was the first man in 4,000 years to be born spiritually alive. 4,000 years. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. That light shined in the darkness. What kind of darkness? The darkness of unregenerated, spiritually dead spirits that had no light. Here he was, the first man to stand on this planet in total darkness with a live spirit. Consequently, he was the first man that was able to fulfill the law because he had no nature of sin. So instead of saying, I had not known sin, save the law said, thou shalt not sin, he was given the law and was able to fulfill it because he had a nature that could keep it. The Ten Commandments. So he fulfilled the law. I mean, he violated nothing. Absolutely fulfilled it. Then turned around and became the curse of the law to redeem them that was for the transgression that was under the First Testament. There wasn't one Jew that could keep the law. That's why there was sacrifice because of transgressions. They couldn't keep it, so he'd say, kill an animal so I could go ahead and maintain my operation of this covenant upon this earth. No man could keep it. No man. They did not have a nature that could keep it. And killing an animal didn't change your nature. What it did was caused accounted righteousness to temporarily cause God to be able to operate in the presence of your soul until all the debt was paid by the blood of Jesus through the eternal spirit. Cleanse your conscience. Hallelujah. Glory be to God, I tell you. 
Now we got a man here, Jesus. Woo, made under the law, made a woman, and the first man to be born spiritually alive, he fulfilled the law, he kept it to the T, and then stepped in to the shoes as a substitute of every Jew could, who could not keep it and became the curse of the law in their place to redeem them that were under the law to free them to the adoption of sons. <laughs> Hallelujah. I could get excited about this. <laughs> so now, he actually causes what we inherited a will. In the, in the 10th chapter, he called it the will, by the which will. But now today we use the word testament and will in the same document. He said it is the reading of his testament, his last testament and will. Well, you can have a living will, but the testament is supposed to be your last one. I mean, this, this is what you had to say. This is the testament or the testimony that you have left behind. But now you can have a, a living will. And that's why he goes on to say here, in the establishment of this will or this testament, there had to be the death of the testator, which made it the last will. <laughs> Resulted in my son's ship. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, if you're going to be strong, you've got to know who you are. You can't just float around in programs and doctrines and expect to be victorious. Who are you? Who are you? <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, I mean, you might have an ordination paper signed by somebody, but try hitting the devil with it. I mean, make him read it. He'll just look at you like you're dumb. Better have something to back that little piece of paper up with. All that paper is supposed to be is, is an outward witness of elders who know of an inward work that was already done. <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, I know who I am. And I'm finding out how to take everything over based on who I am. I don't even check my check stubs when I ask him to move them out. Well, why should I? Everything I have is His already anyway. And then He gives me the provision out of it. <laughs> Ooh, I don't know if I can take this. You might have to help me. <laughs> Hallelujah! For His Word! Yeah! Hallelujah! Glory be to God! I know. Who are we? <laughs> Hallelujah, Jesus. Glory be to God. I'm a son. I'm a son of God with an inheritance. Hallelujah. <laughs> I'm a son of God. Devil stomping, mountain moving, miracle working, inherited son of God. Hallelujah. So we have a testament here now he's talking about. And the 14th verse he says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works by a new nature to serve the living God. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament. That is, that's going to be the reading of the final will. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgression that was under the First Testament, they which are called might receive that promise of eternal inheritance. We'll read that testament. Read the will. <laughs> He says, for where a testament is, that is the final reading, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, 
Otherwise, it is no strength at all while the testator lived. Well, what I like, what I like, he died as the testator of our will. <laughs> then he rose to administrate it <laughs> as the firstborn from the dead. <laughs> I like that. He kind of he wanted to make sure that you just would have to be really ignorant to lose. Your Bible has to be dusty. If you're too ignorant to read the will, maybe you ought to lose. He rose as the firstborn from the dead and the firstborn of many brethren. Now, the Word of God calls him the firstborn from the dead. Well, how about Adam? No. No, Adam was the first to be born spiritually alive as, as the Son of God. Then he died. But his spirit didn't come back alive until the firstborn from the dead came back alive, which was Christ. Well, he called him the firstborn from the dead. And Romans called him the firstborn of many brethren. Well, if he's the firstborn from the dead, he couldn't be talking about a physical resurrection because that happened through the Old Testament. In fact, before Jesus rose from the dead, when the last to raise was Lazarus. There was many, many, many born from the dead, if that's what you want to call it, before his resurrection. So why did he call him the first if it wasn't his spiritual death he was not talking about? How could he call him the first? Well, he's the first born from the dead. Who knows? Adam might have been the second. But I have a feeling when he went all of those that was holding notes with accounted righteousness waiting for the firstborn to be born. I have a feeling that the Holy Ghost just emptied the whole place out at once. Oh, Adam, I could just see, man, I waited a long time for this. That's right, you caused a lot of trouble. <laughs> Hallelujah. Firstborn from the dead, and he rose. Not only the death, the death of the testator, but the firstborn of many brethren in the administration of the new will. Hallelujah. Well, testator carries with it the new or the last will and testament. I mean, it's. It's supposed to be the last one read. Well, one more time. You can have a, a living will. But when they read your testament, you're supposed to be dead. <laughs> well, no longer will I stand outside of my father's house and scream at him that I have a covenant. I want something to eat. I'm going to go in and say, I'm your son. Why? Because I'm the benefactor of a will. Well, what, what did the will? Eternal inheritance. I'm his son. He stuck with me. <laughs> he said, let's furnish. Let's furnish the marriage covenant with good and bad. Well, you might be a little bad. You might be his goodest. But you're still in. <laughs> you might be gnashing your teeth and losing reward. But he's going to feed you for an eternity. That's for sure. Hallelujah, I'm in, I'm his son, I'm in, I'm in. So why are you in? Well, I'm the benefactor of the reading of the will and testament of my oldest brother. <laughs> Jesus, you're the benefactor? Well, do you have, are you a covenant man? No, I'm a son. It's already been read. <laughs> thank you. The lawyer already read it. The Holy Ghost, yeah, thank you, thank you. And if I need to be refreshed, all that my father's estate has, I'll just keep meditating on the will because it's really big. But I'm a son, and I've inherited everything that's in it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hello, Son of God. Yes, what do you want? I don't know. I think I want to worship a minute again. I guess. Hallelujah! Aren't you going to help me out again? Come on. Thank you for His Word. You know who you are. Do you know who you are? Yes. Yes. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Yes. All right. I believe we can make it now. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm sure glad I go to this church. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm so glad. Hallelujah. So then the 16th verse again said, For where a testament is, that's the last reading of the will, there must also be the death of the testator. <laughs> you know, I, you're gone. You know, you're gone. They're, they're distributing what you had. You're gone. For a testament is a force after men are dead. <laughs> Otherwise, it is no strength at all. While the testator liveth. Well, then he went to say, Whereupon neither the first testament is dedicated without blood, because it was the type. But go on over now to the 10th chapter. When he talks about the, the type, he says, For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made every year for sins. For it's not possible. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifices and offerings thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book that is written of me. Jesus said, To do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin thou wouldest not. Neither hadst pleasure therein which were offered by law. Then he said, Lo, I come to do thy will. Now circle it or underline it. Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will. Now he makes reference to the volume that was in that will. When the testator came in the volume of the book that was written of him to do that will. And then it become the last testament, the establishment of that covenant, when he died. But notice how he calls it here. For the which will, by that will, in the volume of that book that was written of me, by the which will, we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offerings, oftentimes the same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But this man, after that he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, Set down at the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies was made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Well, how did he do that? Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, I will put my laws in their heart and in their minds, I will write them. 
and their sins and their iniquities I will remember no more. Now one day you was in a service when the will of God was read. It talked about the death of the testator, the man who came to fulfill the will in the volume of the book that was written of him. He came, fulfilled that will, and then as the testator died and then rose from the dead. And he said, and this is the covenant speaking of that whole process that I will make with them in the last days. One day, somebody stood up before you and read that will in the form of the final testament and said, and the testator died and he left you this will. And through that death, he cleansed you from the sins under the redemption of the first testament. From all the sins under the first testament. And then when you were purged from them, you rose from the dead and became a son of God. Why? Somebody stood before you and read the will. And the will said you could have eternal life and inheritance with God and be a son. And they read that will and it was fulfilled. And you became a son. Now you're a son. Is that will still in force? Yes. But not for you. For the rest of the world. He wants you to go and read that will to them. He has a covenant with the sinner. He has sonship with you. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are you excited yet? Are you more than a conqueror? Well, which son are you? Prodigal or elder? <laughs> Hard choice, isn't it? Well, I, I'm the prodigal when he uh, got himself right. That's what I am. <laughs> well, this gets interesting. Now, twice he testifies about writing his laws in our hearts and our minds and our sins and our iniquities. He'll remember no more because they were born again. He purged us from the consciousness of sin, made us sons and daughters of God and give us an eternal inheritance as a son and a daughter. But in Hebrews, he testifies twice about the Holy Ghost's witness to that, twice. In Jeremiah, of course, it was 31, but... Here in Hebrews, let's go look at the second testimony. Go back to the eighth chapter for a minute. When you became a son, this is how he worded it. Beginning with the seventh verse of the eighth chapter of Hebrew, he said, For the first covenant, and the word covenant really isn't even in there, it's in italics, but we know what he's talking about. He says, For if the first had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Because, of course, under the first then, you'd have been already a son. <laughs> you had to have your sins purged. You can rest assured, my friend, in sacrifices and offerings, he took no pleasure. He took no pleasure in the sacrifice of his son. But only because he looked beyond, beyond, Jesus cried, you know, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. What he was really saying, if there's any other way that mankind could be redeemed, let this pass from me. Now, there's no way he'd ever said that if they hadn't already ran 10 million equations seeking just for any other way. Because he had absolutely no pleasure in the burning and the shedding of blood of sacrificial animals. It's not his nature. His nature is to give life. You have no idea what this cost him to have you just to even have a free will. It's just a free will. See, in God's attributes, which there's nine of, all his attributes are sovereign. And in the nine attributes, two of them, is immutability, which means he can't change and you can't change him. Nobody, you, anybody, the devil, no one, you can't alter him. There's nothing about him that anything outside of him has the power to change. You just can't do it. 
referring to a sundial, he says, there's not even a shadow from turning. He never changes. His sovereignty is one of his attributes, and in that sovereignty, he is sovereign every other attribute. Sovereignly. Sovereignly every other attribute. And another one is love. He sovereignly love. And love, love's not a dictator. Therefore, he had to leave his creation with a will. That's why Satan created so much havoc. Because the, the life that God gave him to have within himself, it was his life. In the sovereignty of God, he is love, not a dictator. He imparts love to any of his creatures. It's sovereignly their life. You can rest assured that the creatures that worship him day and night before his throne are not forced to do so. They are in his presence because he's inexhaustible. And each day and night that they spend in worship, if you can take nights for teaching, every day they can't wait to explore the next second, the next moment. They're there by their own will because they choose to. And he sovereignly loved. He's not a dictator. It was at that price he gave Adam to have life within himself. And even though Satan took the life, he sovereignly gave him in love, used it to destroy his creation with. It was still his life. When he gave Adam his life, and he used it to do what he did with it. It was still his life. Well, in God's immutability, he couldn't change himself into something that could fellowship with Adam. So at the, cross, at, at the cost of unfathomable, in the sovereign love, he had to leave him with a will. As he can't be a dictator. Therefore, it took 4,000 years to change humanity back into something God could fellowship with at an unfathomable cost of the will. Why it cost heaven. A thousand equations. He had no pleasure in sacrifices, yet there was no other way. 10,000 equations. No other way. No other way. Well, at a price you can't even begin to conceive that life you have in you. He's no dictator. You have choice of will. So did Adam. And you can't count the people in hell because of it. This is why it moves the Father beyond comprehension. When hell has come at you four different directions, believe they have broken you but you take your will something that cost God so much and turn and lift your hands and begin to worship him it moves the father beyond you have no idea what your life and your will cost him for you to do that so when hell's lying to you and you choose raise your hands and say hell can go back where it come from I'm going to worship my father <laughs> yes you have no idea what it cost him for you to do that and that's why the father often breaks down and weeps when you do it often Well, I'm a son. He happened to be my father. But he also happens to be God. And I am a worshiper. Oh, look how he words this here. 
Seventh verse again, for, for if the first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant I made with the fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. Then he goes into ours. This time he calls it a covenant, because God made it with men. It's our testament, which Jesus fulfilled, and the volume of the book written of him, which was his will. Death of the testator. I'm the benefactor of the will. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, after the finishing of the old covenant, saith the Lord. I will be to them a God. They shall be to me my people. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Well, know the Lord. But notice the difference in the two covenants now. For all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. Why? For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities. I will remember no more. For when he put his law into our hearts and our minds, he wrote them. The Ten Commandments literally went from an exterior thing given to a spiritually dead nation which they could not keep to part of our nature. When he wrote them in our minds and our hearts, which we could keep. And for this reason, he said, their sins and their iniquities, I will remember no more. We don't have to say, every man, teach his neighbor to know God. Through what? Exterior. Commandments. Sacrifices. Holy days. Law. For you all shall know me, he says. How is that? From the least to the greatest can have the same knowledge, same relationship. For I'll write those Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Have no other gods. All of these things. Why? Because now when he wrote it into my heart, we all can know him. No difference from the least to the greatest because he has given us his nature, canceled our sins and our sins and our iniquities. He remembers no more. We all can know him through that new nature from the least to the greatest. So as a client nation, I do not have to be taught to know God through ordinances, sacrifices, but we all can know him from the least to the greatest. Wrote his laws in our hearts, our mind he has put them. Our sins and our iniquities he remembers no more. So we all can know him. He said the shadow. He said the shadow is the type. He said that the shadow, all of these things, but the shadow is of the body. And the body that's making the shadow is Christ. For once what is making the shadow gets here. Why do you want to live in the shadow? In fact, it's impossible to live in the shadow and the thing that's making it at the same time. He said the body that's of Christ. Well, once the body gets here, why do you want to live in the shadow that the body was making before it got here? (laughs) Paul says, have I bestowed all this labor upon you in vain? Who has put you under a curse? Or who is practicing witchcraft? Or who has bewitched you that you can believe that you can start out in the flesh, start out in the spirit born again and end up perfected by the flesh? He says that you would keep these ordinances and the Sabbaths and the holy days. All those things was a shadow of what is to come. But now that the body which is of Christ has got here, why do you want to try to live in the shadow? All of a sudden, these people walk out with a new revelation, you know. Oh, yes, we're going to keep the Sabbath. Well, once you was born again, you started. What, are you going to go to the shadow and live in the type? 
as we've said so many times, in one of the first statements he opened up to me when he opened up the Born Again Trail, which is the name of these morning teachings right now. You know, we should be able to get on to something, but I'm finding out this is the New Testament. <laughs> I don't know if I can leave that, you know. <laughs> in the Born Again Testament, and in the New Testament, the, the reading of the will, I mean, don't you, wouldn't you think that that would be on the born-again trail? I mean, that's what made you a son. I think we'll probably never get off the born-again trail. See, how many takes? About three, four hundred, you know. <laughs> but the Sabbath, which is a day of rest, to keep holy, he said. You couldn't even pick a stick up for fire or nothing. It, it'd catch you and then the penalty for picking a stick up on the Sabbath was death. They, you would think that law was peculiar, you know. Well, what are you doing with that stick on the Sabbath and walking? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cook some pancakes. Line them up against the wall. And the elders hit you in the head with rocks until you're dead. And this was the day of rest. You're so worried about violating it, who can get any rest? <laughs> Well, what was that a type of? He said, if Joshua would have given them rest when he led them into the promised land, why would he have bothered to spoke of another day? He said, this is the rest. He said, this is the rest that we enter to. When you're born again, and then you come out from under the load of the sin nature, and you receive his nature, when you're born again, that's when you enter into the rest he was talking about. That Sabbath is Jesus who is the Lord of the Sabbath. And when you enter into that rest, it's because you're born again and cease from your own labors. Why couldn't I take a stick up? Let me ask you this. Outside of Jesus Christ, is there any other way to be saved? Then it couldn't be by your works, lest any man should boast. So that man picked the stick up, and what that represented is there's another way you can work for your salvation. There was another way to be saved outside of Jesus Christ, which is grace, and there is no way. Stay out of the shadow. That's where the devil lives. (laughs) He's under the bed. We said we all can know him now. We don't have to know him through ordinances, keeping this and keeping that. Now we know him now through our new nature and sonship. All right, but looking at this statement a little bit closer now, go to Romans, the second chapter. I may have to lead into this. Well, I'll just lead into it this way. Look at the 11th verse. For there is no respecter of persons with God. This is Romans 2 and 10. We're going to get into this in some detail. It has to do with your reward. It has to do with the standard you're walking by now. I am a son. The laws have changed. I am a son. Law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. The law of the new nature. The spirit of life is your born again spirit. Has made me free from the law of sin and death. What's the law that emanates from my... That that law that emanates from my new nature is the law that set me free from the law that used to emanate. Emiate. (laughs) Emanate through my spiritually dead spirit. It was a law. And it said that I was spiritually dead and the fruit of that death was sin. I couldn't get free. Now the law of the spirit of life, the spirit of life is my born again human spirit, emanates from that, from that. New nature is that new nature. That's a law. That was the only one that could set you free from the other law of sin and death. Hallelujah. Well, I don't mind telling you, I'm really glad to be free. All right, this is really, now, 
Now watch this closely now. Stay with me real close here. 11th verse. He said, There's no respect of persons with God. For as many have sinned without law, shall also perish without law. And as many as sinned in the law, they shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but it's the doers of the law that are justified. Now, isn't this interesting? In 13, he said, the doers of the law are justified. Oh, is that so? We'll go to the third chapter. Let your little finger roll over to the 20th verse. Notice 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, all right, there's a doer. There's a doer, isn't he? By the deeds of the law, that's a doer. There shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Well, then look at 13. What did it say? For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law are justified. But yet, in 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. Well, which one of these does he want us to believe? <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> We're going to have to take a little more time to attack it than 10 minutes, though. What I was really after is the next part, which is 14. But let's read 13 again and give you a little hint. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. So he made that statement to prove why the Gentile is justified without the law. Because even a Jew wasn't justified unless he could keep the law. Well, the truth of the matter is, the part of the law that he was saying that they needed to keep was the part that dictated the new nature, which no one could keep. No one could keep it, so... And that's what this statement was referring to by the deeds of the law. Should no flesh be justified in any sight. Why? Because nobody could keep it. It was impossible for the sacrifice of blood, and, blood of goats and bulls to take away sin. So there was no way to, to keep what the new nature dictated that we needed to keep. That's why he said a Gentile can be saved without the law because by his new nature he does the things that's contained in the law. So what he was saying here that no, no flesh is justified by the law in the sight of God. For the law is the knowledge of sin. For here, he was saying, there would be no Jew justified either unless he could keep the law. So what he was saying, it's impossible so they can't be justified by it. That's why a Gentile who receives a new nature and has the law written in his heart and in his mind can keep it. So Paul went on in this same chapter to say later on, doesn't that become circumcision to him? Whereas a Jew who's circumcised by law and can't keep it, doesn't that become uncircumcision? Isn't the whole point here to be able to keep the nature that's in the law and not the letter of it? Or should I say the letter of it which can't save you? And notice what he says now. 13 again, For it's not the hearers of the law that are just before God but the doers. And they couldn't do it until they received a new nature. And he explains that in 14. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, by, do by nature, which nature? The new nature. The things contained in the law. Why? Because he wrote them in their heart and their mind. These having not a law are a law unto themselves. How can that be? Which show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, the new nature, bearing witness, their thoughts the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing one another. When will they do that? In the day when God shall judge the secret of men's hearts by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Now, he's talking here about the great judgment seat of Christ. When you stand there, for the works and the deeds done in the body, both good and bad, for reward or for loss of reward. But in that, he's saying now, by, by nature, if the Gentile, who didn't even have the law, by his new nature, keeps, keeps the nature of the law, 
or the Ten Commandments, which he explains later in this chapter. If we, by the new nature, take the things contained in the law or keep them, isn't that a law unto themselves? He says, meanwhile, our new nature bearing witness, accusing or excusing, what? I used to think other people. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about your conscience accusing or excusing one another. The thoughts bearing witness. Meanwhile, your conscience excusing or accusing one another. Every thought that you have is either else excused or accused by your conscience in that new nature. And people say, I just didn't know that that was sin. Oh, that's funny. Because the Word of God here says when you receive that new nature that you're keeping the law now because of that new nature. You're keeping the nature that was in the law that He wanted you to keep was the Ten Commandments. It says, Thou shalt not, shall not, shall not, shall not. Well, no man could keep it until he received a new nature. So now that you have that new nature, He says, Meanwhile, He says, Your conscience Bearing witness, accusing or excusing one another, all of your thoughts. Well, every time something rises up, that's not right. It says my new nature will excuse or accuse that thought. Well, I, I didn't know that. Oh, you didn't? It's funny because we have a law unto ourselves now in that new nature that excuses or accuses every thought that you have. Well, nobody told me that was wrong. You're probably just lying so you can keep on doing it because you have a new nature that either excuses or accuses it. Well, I don't want to face it. Well, you're going to on the day of judgment seat of Christ because that's the standard you're going to be judged by. If I was you, I'd really listen. <laughs> For every time the devil of the soul tries to do something or tries to say something, it's either us accused or excused by the new nature. If it's excused, you're okay. If it's accused, it's wrong. But I did not know. Of course you didn't, but you will in that day because he's going to burn the trash. <laughs> it would be better that you face it now when it will not show up in loss of reward. <laughs> Wouldn't you think my mind is running 80 different directions and I'd have to pull it back to quote this. Then look at it again. Now remember now, 13, 14, if you read them over and over and over, for not the hearers of the law just before God, but the doers. Well, the problem was the Jew couldn't keep it. it. had a spiritually dead nature. The doers of the law shall be justified. Well, who becomes a doer? The man that receives a new nature. He's not covered by animal blood. He's a true doer. He has the new nature in him. For when the Gentiles who do the law, or not do not have the law by nature, new nature, the things contained in the law, these having not a law are law unto themselves through that new nature. It's governed through the new nature who show the works of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. What part of the law is he talking about? Simple. 16. In the day when God shall judge the secret of men's hearts by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, Paul said, Behold, you call yourself a Jew. You rest in the law. You make your boast in God. You know His will. Approved of the things that are more excellent. Being an instructor of the law, you're confident that they're yourself a guide to the blind, a light to them that are in darkness, an instructor to the foolish, a teacher of babes which has the form of knowledge and the truth of the law. Thou therefore which teaches another, teachest thyself, that when you preach that a man should not steal, thou sayest a man should not commit adultery, thou sayest that you should not, or you should abhor idols and do not commit sacrilege, that thou makest thy boast of the law, and through breaking the law you dishonor God. So what part of the conscience was he talking about here? That the Gentile now, now, now that the law becomes a law unto themselves. What part? That's why he went on and talked about the Jew who's an instructor of the law and listed the Ten Commandments. Because that is really a description of the new nature. That's the part they couldn't keep. He says, now you think the law saves you? Every one of you Jews, you preach, you should not commit adultery, not lie, commit sacrilege. He said, but every one of you are doing it. So how can the law save you? 
But now here's this Gentile. He receives a new nature. Comes along within itself. He has a new conscience. And now every thought is being accused or excused. And by the way, you're going to be judged by that when you stand before me. He said. Repeat all that back. Good thing we don't give written tests. Did you get that? 